Howdy, friends. Welcome to 50's Cheese. My name is Clem, and the boss sent me out here to the garage to show you these movies, since he's embarrassed to be seen with them. What we have here are highlights of cheap old movies that don't really have highlights. And just some scenes that aren't quite as bad as others. From the golden age of B-movies. And since Misery Loves Company, I'll be joining you in watching them. Only I'll be commenting on them as well. You can too, only nobody will hear you. The movies we will be viewing are from a collection entitled 50 Sci-Fi Classics. Their definition of sci-fi is a little flexible. Few lean more towards fantasy. A, a number of them are horror wannabes. Some are action-adventure movies, just in a bizarre, or at least exotic, setting. Some are D, none of the above. Let's just say these are the kind of movies you would have seen on Mystery Science Theater 3000. In fact, a few of them were. The rest probably weren't good enough. I don't want to mislead you more than I have to. These are not, strictly speaking, first-time viewing reactions. The ones from MST3K I've seen before, of course. But what you will be seeing are mashups of two viewings. One to get my bearings, and one to catch whatever I missed the first time. And they won't be the full movie, just highlights, or lowlights to be more accurate. And the more memorable scenes. So, with all that in mind, let's watch the movie. Well, friends, today we face off against 1953's Phantom from Space, which delivers exactly what it says. Starring, well, nobody in particular, but featuring a number of co-equal character actors. An interesting casting concept. Today's weather, mostly cloudy, with a chance of thunderstorms. It has nothing to do with the movie. This is Washington, D.C. And in the files of the Central Bureau, there is a story so strange Central in Bureau? That it defies Chest of drawers in the middle of the room? It is the story of a handful of people who in the course of one desperate night held back a wave of panic and pandemonium. It began after sundown, time 7.15, as Flight A coast patrol Much from meaningless Field narration. to Bay. Time 7.19, an unidentified object was picked up 200 miles southwest of Point Barrow, Alaska. 7.27, unidentified object confirmed at Fairbanks, Alaska. Heading south, southeast, 170 degrees. Height, 75,000 feet. That's Estimated a movie speed, projector. 5, My uncle had one, hour. just like it. White warning. F sharp 4, uh, 370 hertz. 200 miles due west of Vancouver, British Columbia. Course, 170 degrees. Height, 60,000 feet. Estimated speed. Down to 3,600 miles per hour. Yellow warning. B4, 494 hertz. First interceptor flight airborne. Point of interception, 80 miles due west of San Francisco, California. 755. Unidentified object past point of interception. Red warning. 811. F5, Bay, 698 California. hertz. Height, 50,000 feet. Estimated speed, 2,000 miles per hour. Okay, we get it. The shiny Lander, thing California. is slowing down and Height, falling 10, as it follows feet. the coast south. Speed, 1,200 miles per hour. 818. All traces of unidentified object gone. Red warning lifted. 
By 8.25 at the Los Angeles branch of the Communications Commission... The Communications Commission, with radio just like television the Central Bureau. ...began to pour in from the beach area. The monitors went to work immediately. Mobile Pretty fancy office the these government the guys have. Especially that TV tray cable desk. Your tax dollars at work. Uh, that Christmas tree antenna Mobile 7 has would only work if it was pointing in a horizontal direction. And the supposed dish on the roof of Mobile 1 is best described as a joke. Mobile Center from Mobile 7, over. Go ahead, Mobile 7. This is Mobile 7 for the Pacific Center in Beach 4. Interference strength 3, bearing 39 degrees, over. This is Mobile Center, roger. Stand by. Mobile 1 and Mobile 7. From Mobile Center, point of interception estimated 3 miles north of surf. Mobile 1, roger. Mobile 7, roger, we'll go now. Excuse me, Joe, phone quick. I need an ambulance. What's the matter? My husband and Pete out there in the picnic grounds just above the beach. They've been hurt. Well, this is a communications car. I'll phone it in from here. I'm over one to Central. Over. Did you make that out, Charlie? Not a word. I'm over one to Central. I can't reach you. Repeat. Well, they must be getting us all right. I'm over one to Central. Have an ambulance sent to beach at Sturp. Emergency. Two men hurt. Acknowledge. Roger and out. I'm sure they'll be here soon now. Tell us what happened. Oh, this man, he just kept coming at us. It was awful. Who? I don't know. He was wearing a suit like a diver. Hurry, please. They're hurt. Charlie, you better wait here. I'll go down and take a look. How are you doing? Oh, uh, we're just taking another reading now. What happened down there? The police took the girl and one of the guys to the station. What about the other one? Well, he's on the way to the morgue. Like I said, <clears throat> we were just starting to eat and we heard something tracking through the sand toward us. I looked up and couldn't see anything. Then Betty screamed. At what? I thought you couldn't see anything. At first we couldn't. Then this, this guy started toward us. What kind of a guy? How should I know? He was wearing some kind of a helmet over his head. He could have been a deep sea diver or anything. All right. After you saw him, see a guy with a crazy helmet with pipes sticking out of it came at you in the dark. And look, I know this sounds, sounds crazy, but there wasn't any head in that helmet. No head. No head at all. It's the truth. I think you need some coffee. I don't want anything. So, now, somebody ought to count the cigarette the smoked in this movie. Okay, thanks for coming down. Please. Maybe make a drinking out. game no out of so it. Long. You too. All right, let's start at the beginning. Oh, did you know the dead man? Now, Mrs. Evans is a good-looking woman. What are you trying to say? <laughs> this guy until I get back. Where are you? You'll stay right where you are. At least until Mrs. Evans feels well enough to talk. What do you want from her? Oh, I just want to see if your story checks with hers. After all, you went to school together, remember? There he is there. He lives next door. His name's George Nelson. Hey, Mr. Nelson. Yes, sir. Come here, will you? I'm Lieutenant Bowers, homicide. You found this, buddy? Mm, That's right. You know, Mr. Mr. Nelson looks like an older Les Nessman. Who are you doing here? I was sitting home watching the fights on TV, and all of a sudden the things start acting up. What has that got to do with it? Of course, you don't know this set. You know, it wouldn't work at all when I came home to supper. Then all of a sudden it cleared up fine. So I thought, well, I'll get set to look at the fights again, and all of a sudden out it goes again. So I thought maybe the battery station down here was overcharged the circuit, and so I just got to take a look. That's all. Hey, don't you ever quit work? What's up this time? Another murder? What are you doing here, Hayes? And so the Maybe communications the team resumed its mission to track the mysterious interference to its source. This movie has a real dragnet, untouchables vibe. The terse Jack Webb-style dialogue and the, the overly dramatic narration. The untouchables at least had the real Walt Winchell. Whoever this guy is, just a cheap wannabe. Units one and seven were instructed to close in. Hey, Charlie, do you see what I see? Yeah, the oil field. Let's hope our trouble's burning up. Well, there's only one way to find out. Look, Sarge, two murders and an explosion in one precinct is big news. Now, come on, you can't pin it all on the young border. Or can you? 
Very funny. Yeah? I'm Hazen of the Communications Commission. Oh, the lieutenant's waiting for you. Thank you. And I guess the reporter is supposed to be comic relief. Sure doesn't add much else to the story. In fact, he doesn't even add much comic relief. It's not a transmitter. We don't get a definite disturbance, just just an appearance. Then you have no idea what it is, huh? Not yet. How are you making up? Not so good. You were here when I questioned that boy about the murder at the beach. Did you get anything more out of him? Yeah. Come on with me. You might want to see this. Ah, I see you're just about done. Thanks, you can go now. Are you sure this is what the man looks like? What do you say, Betty? Well, just about. Only I think the tubes were a little lower down. And you still insist there was no head inside the helmet? I'm probably sure there was. You're the uh, watchman at the Huntington Oil Fields? Oh, yes, sir. I've been with the company for over 22 years. Yeah. Will you tell Mr. Hazen here exactly what happened? Walter? Like I said before, I was just closing the gate for the night when I saw this fellow coming up. I was never so scared in my life. Yes, go on. Well, it wasn't the man so much as the suit he was wearing. Now, if you saw this man again, would you recognize him? I mean, by his outfit. Oh, I'll never forget that sight if I live to be a hundred, sir. You see, this is the man. Wait, sure, that, that's him. Yeah, thank huh? you very much. You may go now. All right, sir. Thank you. Well, Higson, what do you say now? Beats me. The descriptions check, all right. This could be some kind of flying suit. High altitude equipment. Yeah, that's what I've been thinking. Well, how do you explain that stuff about the missing head? No, we can discount that. These people were frightened. Tonight, nobody really took a close look at it. I guess you're right. But whoever he is, that outfit doesn't look like one of ours. Of course. He could have been dropped by parachute. You mean sabotage? I think we better wire a report to Washington, see what they say. Oh, you can use our teletype. I'll tip off the only place to, please, to be on the lookout for something unusual. Hey, wait a minute. What about the press? Oh, I don't think they know too much now. You better keep it that way for a while, at least, till we find out whether our friend is still around here. Well, if he is, I think we can find him for you. My hunch is that he's, he's carrying something around that's causing all this disturbance, whether he knows it or not. Come in, Lee. Sorry to interrupt you, Lieutenant. Yo, what is it, Jim? There's a teletype camp for you. Oh, thanks, Jim. We're waiting for it. That was fast. Well, here's our answer. Looks like they never sleep in Washington. Just a contact of Major Andrews, care of Dr. Wyatt, director of the Griffith Institute. It's kind of late. Man, I'll give him a call. While well, you're at it, I'll go out the car and check on the central. Okay. The Griffith Institute is actually the Griffith Observatory, well, that's a story now. located in, we got in Griffith in Park, they told us to contact home to here. countless cheap movies, Very especially at the caves in Bronson go? Canyon. When I see something like this, I understand why you gentlemen might have thought sabotage was involved. I don't know whether you know it or not, but somewhere around 7.30 this evening, our radar networks picked up an unidentified object off Point Barrow, Alaska. They traced it clear down to Santa Monica before they lost it. Santa Monica? That's where we first picked up our radio interference. Yeah, right at the scene of the murder. Well, then, if all these things tally up, we've got some idea of how our man got here. You mean that he came in some plane? In that case, somebody would have seen it land and take off again. Or did it crash? No. No, we don't think it was a plane. No rocket or jet that has been built so far can attain the speeds of 5,000 miles an hour, particularly for such a great distance. And maybe we're on the wrong track altogether. Couldn't your unidentified object have been a meteor? They travel at a terrific speed. Yes, fast enough for most of them to burn themselves out the moment they hit the Earth's atmosphere. And did it occur to you that meteors are not very likely to travel horizontally all the way from the North Pole to California? Well, if it wasn't a meteor, a flying missile of some type, how do you figure this phantom ties in? We're not sure that he does. I don't care what you say, but it doesn't make sense to me. Anybody trained in sabotage would say on the cover, this guy's walking around in a monkey suit, killing people. Excuse me, Dr. Wyatt. Is there a Lieutenant Bowers in here? Oh, uh, yes. What is it, miss? There's a Mr. Wakeman from the Chronicle here to see you. Wakeman here? Now, what does he want? Well, there's only one way to find out. Before you go, Lieutenant, I don't believe you've met my assistant, Barbara Randall. Well, hello. Hello. It's Mrs. Randall, Lieutenant. I'll be right back. All right. That's right. Shouldn't have come up here. But I've got to get you a wrangle on this beach murder. And your whole department is shut up. Look, Wakeman, will you stop bothering me? There's nothing to say. If you've got an exclusive story from that Evans Damon or Border, then you know as much as I do. Yeah, but that does, still doesn't explain anything about the guy without a head. 
Come on. Who is it? Your guess is as good as mine. Do you mean you let those two kids go without knowing that? I don't buy it. Well, I did. Well, then you must have an awful good reason. I bet you're trying to tie it in with that other murder. All right, Lieutenant. Don't tell me. I'll get my story somehow. Oh, if you want to know how things turn out, read the Chronicle in the morning. By 12.30 a.m., the dragnet was in operation. Mobile units patrolled the streets and countryside. They covered an area 35 miles square. Special and sensitive equipment was prepared for action. Everyone on the job was ready to move on the first signal from the Communications Commission. Monitor Corona to Mobile Center, Strength 4, Brickyard at 160th, moving toward oil fields. Contact your units, over and out. Units 1 and 7 from Mobile Center. Units 1 and 7 from Mobile Center. Strength 4, interference at 160th in the oil field. Moving due east. Just got here, trying to set this up. What gives, Hazen? It's in this area, all right. I thought the Geiger counter. Thank you, Doctor. Why don't I walk over those oil fields? Well, it doesn't register as far as the oil fields. I think we'll do better if we split up. Man. Right, Lieutenant. You two go that way, Lieutenant, out here. Then Joe, you follow him. Come on, Doctor. And you? Oh, forget it. job to do. So do we. And I'm afraid ours will have to come first. And there's no radiation from the helmet. But look at this. So that's what's been causing all the trouble. Charlie, you know where we can There's the radiation hot enough to grill a steak. Right and they just stand up, around it. Now we all thought that this phantom might be carrying some device that was causing all the signal interference. Such a lens that it's due to the very clothes on his body. That's not the only thing that bothers me. Did any of you get a good look at his face? Not me, he's too far away. Well, I did. Unless I'm mistaken, that helmet was empty. Hey, where am I going to put this stuff? Oh, put it in Dr. White's station. Yeah, we take it back to the Institute. Right. Why on earth would Mobile <laughs> 7 right. just happen to have a no, lead-lined right. box it. with him? Any luck? Not a sign of him. The boys are still searching the ground. For what? Nobody knows what he looks like without that outfit. Oh, Bill and I, Major. The reporter got a flash picture of him, and I just happened to borrow that film. It's on its way to headquarters right now to be developed. Good. Send us a print as soon as you can. Sure. Lieutenant, are you sure you don't want to come with us? We want to make a few tests at the lab. I'd like to, Doctor. Would you know the situation? I've got to get that guy. Let me know how you make out, will you? Yeah, we'll do that. Sure. <laughs> What was that all about? Good evening, Doctor. We were just on our way home and we saw you 
drive in. Good evening, Barbara. Hello, Hello Bill. I see we got here just in time. Anything new? Lots of excitement, but that's all. Major, you know Barbara's husband? Oh, of course. How are you? How are you? Hey, it's a nice-looking dog you've got there. What's his name? His name? Venus. Say, Bill, I hate to ask this, but something important has come up, and I wonder, can we borrow Barbara for about an hour or so? I suppose so. Uh, of course. Darling, why don't you go and do the shopping? Here's the list. The market's open all evening. I wonder if we were told earlier that Bill was a teacher to explain his geeky appearance. Good night. I'll give you a hand with it. Oh, thanks, Doc. Easy now. Look up your fingers. They really think just a thin uh, pair of gloves is going to protect them? The oil refinery. You mean you were that close to him and you didn't catch him? I'm afraid so. That's up to the police now. Hand me those shears. I want to cut up this material to work with it. Hey, you better have those sharpened. But I just bought them. All right. Here, try this knife. He thinks he can tear something that can't be cut. This stuff is tougher than nylon. Why don't I try it over a Bunsen burner? You know, from certain angles, Barbara looks a lot like Carol Burnett, especially as Eunice in the Mama sketches. Either. It's practically even the same hairdo. Look, Radioactive. And apparently indestructible. Thank you. What's the matter? You tell me. Take a look at that weed. What weed? There is none. This material is one solid mass. Matthew. Why, well, you're right. It must be some sort of plastic. No. I'd say it's a metallic substance of some kind. Well, I've seen a lot of interesting alloys, but never anything like this. Let's try an acid test. All right. Go ahead. Careful now. We'll only take a drop or two. It repels acid like a raincoat repels water. Why, well, there's no reaction. Well, Major, this looks as though we're going to be here for a long time. The gas in the helmet tank breaks down to 11% methane. Ordinary marsh gas? What's the rest of the formula? Oh, that's where I'm stuck. I can't figure it out. It just doesn't respond to any of the usual tests. Well, how could anyone exist on that combination of gases? You and I couldn't. But apparently someone can. Oh, doctor, are you trying to say that our X-man doesn't breathe oxygen and hasn't the metabolism of a normal human? I really don't know. From what we've seen, he has some physical characteristics which make him appear human. But added to them is this fabulous radioactivity that none of us could stand. I can survive right here in this island. Obviously, he needs it to survive. Otherwise, he wouldn't have risked wearing it where he was sure to be recognized. As it is, he only took it off when he was cornered. But if what you say is true, how can he exist without it now? Let me put it this way. It's like a patient in an iron lung. Sometimes one can, can be removed for hours at a time without any ill effects. Exactly. And I think the same principle applies here. And that means sooner or later, he has to get his breathing apparatus back or die. I don't understand. Well, I've got an idea. If we were to return this whole outfit to where he left it, he might be tempted to come back to it. 
Dr. Wyatt speaking. Yes, he's here. No, thank you. Hello, Major. Still at it, huh? Mm-hmm. No, we haven't got a thing, no. The picture? Yeah, hold on. He says the picture the reporter took of our man didn't come out. I was afraid of something like that. The radioactivity must have burned the emotion. Hello. No. No, we didn't find any fingerprints at all in this clothes. Did you find any? Oh, too bad. Hello? Will you wait there, please? <laughs> we don't know what to make of this either. Have you heard from the communication boys yet? Well, let's hope they turn up with something. Major, excuse me. Hold on a second. Yes. It's Mr. Wakeman of the Chronicle. He insists upon seeing you. He does? Where is he? I told him to wait in the lobby. Sure. Is that you, Doctor? Otherwise, you wouldn't have brought that suit up here. Well, let's just say we were curious. Hello, Bill. And another look-alike. Bill is, is very room? much a know. less Where's massive that, George know. Reeves, the original TV Superman Clark Kent, complete with glasses. Suddenly, she's back. She's not up there. Where's the doctor? He went down to the basement. Here he comes. You didn't find her? No. I'd better call the police. But there's no telling what could happen to her in the meantime. No, no, take it easy. We're doing the best we can. But she said she was locked in. And she couldn't see who did it. Can you explain that? One, one, two, one, one, two, three. In the lab. 
The door was locked until she said it wasn't. Center for Mobile One, come in, please. This is Mobile Center. Go ahead. Get hold of Major Andrews or Dr. Wyatt at the Institute. I want to talk to either one of them. I will do. Stand by, Mobile One. Dr. Wyatt speaking. Oh, yes, Mr. Hayden. Yes, we're still at it. Uh, lots and lots of excitement, but nothing definite yet. Have you anything to say? Yes, the lights went out. The trouble seems to be just about gone. We got a flash in the direction of the observatory once in a while, but I figure that's because of the outfit you're testing. Yes, Lieutenant Bowers ought to be here any minute. Of course. How long will it take you to get up here? Good. See you then. Thank you, gentlemen. Put it down here, please. Barbara, bring that cord in over there. Now you're going to see. I have to resort to ultraviolet light in order to show you what little there is left of the space suit. As you can see, it has reduced itself to this liquid and it is in an evaporating stage. The helmet is in the lab and still intact. This is amazing. All the radiation in this suit would, would be fatal to a normal human being wearing it. Of course. And furthermore, our respiratory system could never simulate gases such as we have found because in that from a civilization that has developed adequate space transportation to enable him to travel to Earth. We have nothing yet that can reach even another planet in our own solar system. That could account for the unidentified objects picked up by radar a few hours ago. My theory is that the spaceship or whatever it was that he came in operated on the principle of magnetic rather than atomic propulsion, and that somewhere in the outer limits met with the condition where the Earth's gravity pulled it down and it fell into the ocean, and that he managed to save his life and reach shore. Re you know, the antennas may have been ridiculous, but that radio in Mobile One is real. And here's one in use by the FCC. Uh, sorry, I mean the Communications Commission. What do you think of that? Huh. Hazen must be crazy sending out stuff like that. I guess so. Why don't you try and get a hold of them? Yeah. Mobile One from Mobile Center. Come in, please. Mobile One from Mobile Center. Come in, please. Mobile One from Mobile Center. Come in, please. Hey, that's Central calling. You better stay here by the car. I'll go tell Hazen. He's around here, this invisible guy. He was in the car. How do you know? I was talking to Randall outside when I heard Central calling. Before I could get over to answer, I saw the door open and shut by itself. He's desperate. For all we know, he could be trying to send a distress signal to his home base, wherever that is. Well, let's hope he doesn't get through. We've got enough problems with just one of those guys. Well, at least we know he's surrounded in the vicinity, and it's obvious what keeps him around. Of course, he's got to come back for what little gas... Several plans that trapped the Phantom went into operation. All obstacles to his entry were removed. To erase any possible suspicion, the doors were left unguarded and inconspicuous electric eye equipment was set up. Which they just the happened to have to lying around. Control board, which would immediately signal the exact location of the trespasser. Talk about high now, tech. There was nothing to do but wait. Well, it's quarter to four. Sure taking his time. Time is cheap. Yeah, but how long can you sit on the edge of your chair like this? Over there if we have to. Well, we hope this mechanism works. It will, unless he flies in between the wires. I wouldn't take any bets that he can't. Well, if everything else fails, we still have Venus here to help us. You know, I'm certain she sensed his presence before. That's why she carried on so. Definitely. What's the matter, Lieutenant? Is this thing getting you? Oh, no, no. I'm just thinking about public reaction to all this. I'd give something to you know, the president. Ever since I was a kid, I wanted to be a pilot. 
And then after I got my wings and had, had 75 missions, I thought I'd seen everything. Now, after all this, I know I haven't seen anything. He's here. The back entrance. Let's cut him off. Come here, take it easy. One time. Finally got what he deserved. chance. We have to take him alive. Plug in the lamps. There's an outlet here. No sound is coming out of his mouth. Look at Venus. She acts as though she hears him. Yes. Dog can hear sounds that we can. His voice must be beyond the range of the human ear. Maybe he's screaming. He's suffocating.
We won't need these lights anymore. In death, he has become visible as a normal body. This is the first movie of any kind I have ever seen where everyone agrees how to proceed and is respectful of each other. You know, military, civilian, scientist, government, police, male, female, everyone. Except for the stupid reporter, of course. A bit of uh, who's who. Writer Miles Wilder was the son of producer-director William Lee Wilder, the younger brother of much more famous and respected producer-director-writer Samuel Billy Wilder. Yes, William was not called Billy, Samuel was. Lee produced and, and or directed and or wrote about 30 films, half of which were shorts, Son Miles had a more illustrious career, mainly as a television writer, but also, also as a producer. He wrote episodes for countless, well, over 50 programs, including 28 episodes of McHale's Navy and the stories for all 16 of the animated Adams Family series in 1973. But his crowning glory was as the producer of the last four seasons of The Dukes of Hazard, half of which he also wrote. So we have some professionals behind this one. So a review of this movie is going to be a bit more positive than others in the genre. Okay, Miles Wilder wrote the story and co-wrote the screenplay. Now the story is Space Creature Lands on Earth and Creates Havoc. Been there, done that hundred times. The screenplay's hit and miss. Uh, and the misses are mainly in the first 15 to 20 minutes, which have, could have been trimmed way down. Wilder wrote mainly television, which only requires 22 minutes of program per half hour. Uh, maybe this longer form just isn't quite his cup of tea. 
And there are a lot of questions, you know, mainly what and how, how left unanswered. Direction is so-so, not uh, not what you'd call creative, but uh, but workmanlike. Now remember, it's Lee, not Billy. Acting is a mixed bag. There are no actual leading characters, no no starring roles. This is more of what's known as an ensemble cast, and the actors pretty much show their individual levels of experience. The cast is, well, unusual in these productions, largely comprised of actors with rather solid resumes, even if the roles were quite minor. For example, Harry Strang, Mr. Nelson, the neighbor with the TV set, has a list of over 500 appearances from 1929 to 1965. Harry Landers, Lieutenant Bowers, had a recurring role on Ben Casey for five years and 90-plus other TV and movie roles. James C., Major Andrews, is one of those actors you know you've seen and seen often, but don't know his name. He did a lot of westerns and was was often a military man like here over a span of 30-plus years, racking up a respectable 230 movie and TV appearances. Uh, continuity had problems uh, more than once. There's a noticeable gap where there could or should have been a scene if they had a couple more hundred dollars to spend. Much of the movie was filmed using what's known as the day-for-night technique, where a nighttime scene is filmed during the day. Unfortunately, technique and technology weren't up to making it convincing in 1953. And the scene was darkened by using filters on the camera and under-exposing the film, but, and that's all they had. So you can't really ding them for it. But there are plenty of daytime and indoor scenes that could have benefited greatly from some better lighting. But again, that would have cost money. Wilder wisely limited the use of effects. You know, for 53, they were decent. I don't remember seeing any wires. But doing more probably would have shown up some shortcomings. Now, overall, as far as movies in general, I'd go about a 5 out of 10. But as 50s cheese, it it earns an 8. It would never win any awards, but it's not terrible. Actually, it's kind of fun. In places, it even held my interest. And it had some unintentional chuckles. No, not the reporter. Like the Phantom, just kind of randomly running around that industrial facility. Masochists and other film aficionados can buy it for themselves or view it on Prime. See the Amazon links in the description. Regardless, thanks for watching. Share, like, subscribe, you know the routine. And stop by again sometime.